Well, hey friends, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here for another Clinical Entrepreneur Podcast episode. I'm your host, Rhonda. You know this if you've been hanging around for a while. I'm super glad you're here. This week, for the next two weeks, I guess, we're gonna talk about a conversation that I get asked, a question, I guess, that I get asked all the time. We are gonna talk about how to start a wellness practice or re-energize the one that you have. Because very often we either are, if we're just, if you're just starting out, you may be just too scared to kind of take that step and take that plunge. And I'm just not sure what to do and what order to do it in. I am going to break that down for you over the next two weeks. This week, we're going to talk about the first three steps. And then next week, we're going to cover the last two steps. But it also applies to those of you that may have an existing practice or your existing practice is focused on your specialty. In other words, you may be a chiropractor or an acupuncturist, a physical therapist, or a nurse working in a traditional model. And you may think, I think I want to branch out and do some wellness work. If that's you, then you are in the right place. That is exactly what we're going to talk about today. So to give you a little bit of context, I was thinking and writing up my notes for this episode and there are a lot of them. So if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see me glance down at my notes. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. So I remember when I first started my practice and I had just finished school, I was still kind of in school learning some other things. And I was so excited and I was so nervous at the same time. Um, I remember thinking, okay, okay, what do I do first? Well, the first thing I have to do is, is well, um, I guess I better open a bank account. Well, then you find out you can't open a bank account until you have a name. So that okay, I, uh, I need a name. And so I called my mom and I said, mom, help me name my practice. My mom's pretty creative. You know, she's kind of got that right side of her brain going. I'm a little more on that lefty side. And uh, so I said, mom, help me name my practice. And she did quite brilliantly, actually. And so I thought, okay, I got it. Well, now what do I need? Oh, I must need a logo. And so I hired a local guy to design a logo that ended up kind of being a disaster, but nonetheless, it was a, a tree with roots. I mean, back in the day, that's what everybody had was a tree with roots for their logo. But anyway, all of that to say, got the tree with the roots, had no idea about color, had no idea about branding, had no idea about anything, but I ended up building a really successful practice and I didn't know any of that. So I'll, I'll make my point about that in a little while. But I, once I had my logo, I have a name and now I have a bank account. I now had to think, okay, well, what am I, where am I going to do my thing? I, I, I need to find a space. I need to do something. So I thought, well, I, I need a desk. I need a phone and I probably need some bookshelves and I probably need a filing cabinet or at least a desk that has a filing drawer. And I remember finding this first spot that I ever moved into, and it took me three weeks to make the decision to say yes to $250 a month rent. Now, I know that that's dating myself quite a bit, but at the time for this little tiny room, it was $250 a month. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to be able to afford this? Like it's $250 and I've got utilities and, and, and internet and phone and oh my gosh. And I remember at the time, my husband saying, I don't know. I don't know if we can afford this. I don't know if we can afford this. And I thought, no, this is my passion. This is what I know I want to do. And I just took the big step and I said, yes. And I signed this really big, scary lease over $250 a month. And off I went, I had no social media. I had no website. And I had what I thought was important, a name, a logo, a desk, some bookshelves, a phone, and me. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I thought, okay, I've just got to get these people in the door. And the patients were pretty few and far between. So most days I would just sit in my little office and I would read or study or listen to things and, you know, try and kind of sharpen my skills because that was part of the whole thing. It's, I was just afraid that I didn't know enough. And truth be told, I didn't because that learning journey is such a process. I mean, if you've been in practice for any amount of time, if you're listening and you're an existing practitioner, I can hear you all saying amen to that sister, because it's true. You don't know enough when you get started and you never will. So give that up more on that later. But anyway, that's what I thought was important. So I waited, waited, and the patients, they started coming, but they were few and far between. And pretty soon it picked up and picked up. And by luck, really, truly, I mean, I'd like to say that I took credit because I was super smart about it. It really, really was just luck that I ended up 
growing a hugely successful practice with a multi-week long waiting list, which is a bad problem to have. It's a good problem and a bad problem. But the bad problem is that if I had to cancel for a day, I literally had nowhere to put these people. I was working five, you know, eight to 10 hour days a week. It was ridiculous. So I had this booming practice in this town of less than a hundred thousand people. So I know you can do it. If I can do it, I knew nothing about nothing except I had a little bit of business background as a bookkeeper, but as far as running a business, it's, you know, itself, I didn't know anything. So here are my five things. And I really thought long and hard about what the five steps would be that I would give you to make it so that you can create that amazing wellness practice. And number one, most important step one, number one, I cannot reiterate this and emphasize this strongly enough. Number one is choose your niche and then go deep. This is the conversation where you say, you know, I'm just going to burn the boats, right? We're either going to succeed at this or we're all going to die. In other words, choose your niche and then go hard, go in and go hard. Because I don't know where this myth came from that says you have to serve everyone and everyone comes to you for help and you just have to help them all. It's the biggest myth in business that there is. Instead, you're not a general store. You are not a general store where you know a little bit about everything, but you specialize in nothing. There's no money there. And there's also not a lot of referrals there because all the other people have a general store. So you're listening to me. I'm telling you, if you want to have a successful practice, figure out your niche and then go deep. My niche by hook or crook, I don't know which, what happened, but my niche ended up being female hormones back in the day. I just fell in love with them. I heard a speaker teach something and I just fell in love with the whole concept. And I already loved working with mamas and babies. And for I knew all of that, but I didn't know enough about it. But when I was exposed to this concept of, of functional fertility and functional reproduction, I went, oh my gosh, that's my drum beat. Those are, that's my tribe. And I just got all excited about it and learned everything I could know about it. And I just, by default, became an expert at it. And that's how I grew my practice. I tell you, that is how I did it. So before you do anything, you have to describe yourself. You have to choose that niche and then describe for yourself in your heart who you want to serve. So here are a few questions that'll help you. Number one, what do you want people to say about you? What do you want them to say about you? I'm not talking about like, oh, he or she, you're a nice person or I like your hair. I'm not talking about that. But when they talk about you to their friends, what do you want them to say about you? To their friends. So someone's saying, hey, you know, Dr. Murray is amazing. He does amazing thing with feet. Like his, he knows feet and he does all the things with feet. Now I know that's really simplified, but that might be how a patient would talk about it. How would they describe it? Well, he knows everything about feet. So what do you want to be known for? What do you want to like put your stake in the ground and you go, this is my thing. This is what I do. This is called picking a niche, choosing a niche, choosing a market, and then going really, really deep in on that subject in that market. It's very important if you want to build a practice that's a gangbuster practice right out of the gate, or if you're reinventing or re-energizing your practice, it might be that you're feeling a little bit of a lull because you haven't chosen that niche or that thing that you're going to specialize in. So I'm going to give you an example before we move to number two. I, want, I just heard this recently from someone and I loved this analogy. So I want you to think of all the people with problems, health problems, being in a river. Okay. And the river just cruises on through and it goes through its little bends and turns and twists and all the people that have health problems are in the river. There are people with feet problems. There are people with hemorrhoid problems. There are people with headaches. There are people with hormone problems. They have, you know, cardiovascular problems. They're worried about having cancer, um, fertility. You know, I mean, the list of problems is probably endless. So all the people with all the health problems are in the river. Now they're going down the river and what are they looking for in the river? They're looking for someone, a sign or something that tells them that somebody knows how to solve their problem, right? So in my example about feet, to kind of lean into that a bit, 
about six weeks ago, I was getting off the boat. I live on a boat for those of you that don't know. And uh, right now, and I got off the boat. We were docking the boat after having taken it out on the water. And I stepped off and I made too big of a step onto the dock. And there was a big uh, fender, it's like a, uh, a fender, like a bumper that goes between the boat and the dock that protects it. And uh, there was two, there was a big one on the dock and I stepped over it and it was a little bit of a long step. And when I landed, I rolled my ankle and I went down. I thought, oh my gosh, I got to get up because like the boat's coming in and I got to tie it off. And I, so I got back up and oh my gosh, it was so sore. And I was kind of limping on it. And I was, I knew I didn't break it because I didn't hear anything. And I also was able to put some pressure on it. So my ankle's been a bit sore, but I was careful with it for a few days and, you know, kind of balanced my weight on my other leg and did the thing. But I, if someone had said to me, Hey, listen, that guy over there, he knows how to fix ankles. I would have been there in a snap. I am like the person in the river with an ankle problem. And I'm just looking for someone to help me fix my ankle problem. Now, side note, we're much better clinicians than we are providers. Did I ever think about ordering something for myself? No, of course not. So if you're going to email me and tell me you should have taken blah, blah, blah. I know I just got busy and didn't do it. But anyway, ankle's better now. So all of that to say, when you are in the river and you have a problem, you're just looking for someone that can solve the problem. Now you, as a practitioner, I want you to think about setting up a lemonade stand in the middle of the river. I know my analogies, a lemonade stand is supposed to be on the side of the road, but just, just go with me here, flow with me in the weather, in the river. I want you to think about setting up a lemonade stand and the lemonade stand has a sign across the top that says, in this case, lemonade, 10 cents. Yours is going to say joints right here. Joint need help with your joints. I'm your person. And all the people that are floating down the river that have joint problems are going to go Roar, and they're going to be pushing around and buying and scrambling, trying to get over to your lemonade stand because you have positioned yourself in the middle of the people who have that problem. And you're saying, look, I appreciate the fact that you have headaches. Yep. I'm a chiropractor. I can fix headaches. I do know how to do that. And if you happen to come to me with a joint problem and you have headaches, Hey, it's a two for one. But what I love to do in my niche is, is joint problems or hormones or whatever it is you choose your thing. So where are you going to put your lemonade stand? You don't want to put your lemonade stand over there, way on the heck of the side of the far, far, far away from the river place and put a sign up that says, I fix joint problems because people aren't out there. Your people are in the river with a problem and people around you, all around you are just looking for someone to solve their problem. That's where you have to be clear about what you're selling. What is your lemonade? Is your lemonade joint problem? Is it hormones, fertility, whatever it is, but pick your niche and then go deep with it. Pitch your river, pitch your lemonade stand inside and around you where the people that are surrounding you in your community, those are the people in the river. We're not talking about the river that has the whole world's problems, just the people in your community. They know, oh, I'm going to go to this guy because he's a joint guy. I'm going to go to this guy because he's a foot guy. I'm going to go to this lady because she's a fertility person. I'm going to go to that person because he's a, a libido, hormone, low T guy, whatever it is. Pick your niche and go deep. So that's number one, how you're going to start a practice. You cannot start anything without knowing who you're going to serve. That's number one. Are right, you ready for number two? All right. Number two, don't wait until you're ready. I hear this all the time from practitioners who will say to me, well, you know, I just, I, I just need to know everything. I just need to, I just need to know. I just have to feel a little bit more confident in my knowledge. I'm calling BS on that. And here's why. Listen, if you're the person who has to know everything before you ever take a step, well, then why did you ever buy a car? Because you don't know everything about how that car works. You just know you get in it and you turn it on. You just know the basic stuff. And as you drive the car a little bit more, you kind of get a feel for the brakes and the gas and the things. And then and when you have to repair it, then the repair guy comes and says, hey, you know, this ball bearings of something needs, I don't know about cars, but you know, you get my point. You don't have to know everything in order to get in the driver's seat. Hello, can I get an amen? 
You don't, and you can't know it because if you spent all the time trying to understand every little thing about every little engine, about every little transmission, all that, you'd be dead before you'd ever know it all. And my friend, there are people out there that are waiting for you. They need your help. All those joint people and those hormone people and the headache people, they need what you have. Don't stop. Don't waste your time because you're never going to be ready. You'll never be ready. You never know enough because the learning happens once you start helping people. Once you start helping them figure out, you'll say, oh, that didn't work. Oh, I better not try that again. That definitely didn't work. But you're in a position where you're working with the patient, the patient's working with you. You're getting a little win. So what if you have one step backward? You stand, you've already had 35 steps forward. One step backward isn't going to make any difference. So it's the net gain. It's the learning that you get all along the way that gets you closer and closer and closer and gets them closer and closer and closer to being able to have success and resolution of their health problems, not masking it with some kind of drug or surgery or other something that never really fixes the problem. So what I want you to do is suit up, come on, get out on the field, start playing. You already have your name. You know, you picked your name. I know you did. You picked your name. Now, you know, your niche, because we just talked about that. You know what you want to be known for. In other words, what do you want people, your friends or people that know you to tell other people about you? That guy's really good at joints or that lady, she's super good with fertility, with female fertility and conception. All people want to know about is that you can help them. That's all they care about because guess what? They don't care about you. Newsflash, newsflash. They don't care a lick about you. They care about what's in it for me. What's in it for them? How are you going to help them? They're going to pay you money and they expect you to help them. That's it. And imposter syndrome is all over this conversation, right? Imposter syndrome. I don't know enough. I'm not, why me? Shouldn't be me. But what I want you to do is just say, you know, that imposter syndrome conversation that's always running in the background. I have it. You have it. The president, everybody has it. It's always running in the background. I just want you to push it to the side. And instead, I want you to have an irrational belief in your ability. I want you to have an irrational amount of belief in yourself that you focus on the people that you're going to serve. You focus on how you're going to help them alleviate their suffering, their pain, their dysfunction, their joint pain, their headaches, their fertility. Your focus is on them. Because when we start getting, well, I don't know if I'm ready to start. I don't know if people really want what I have. I don't know. And all that doubt starts to come in. Who are you making it about? Um, hello, you're making it about you. And you're being selfish. If I could just be so bold to say that. But you're being a bit self-centered. So stop. Turn the conversation around and say, okay, who am I here to serve? I'm not here for me. I'm here for them because I do know how to fix bloating. I'm good at it. And if someone has a digestive issue, I know how to do that because I struggled with it myself. So I know how to fix it because I fixed myself. You see how the difference is such a different way of looking at it. So don't wait until you're ready. Just get in the game and start kicking the ball around the field because that's how you learn. And the faster and the better you get at kicking that ball, the faster and better you're going to be at helping your people, the people that come to you. And the reason that we do this is your bank account gets healthier too, right? Because you start to serve them and they say, I will be more than happy to pay you for this exchange of service. I pay you, you help me. It's a beautiful exchange. Money is just an exchange of energy. You're just using your energy to help them and they're thanking you with their money. That's all. So don't wait until you're ready. Imposter syndrome, push it aside and have that irrational. I mean, irrational, it makes no sense how much you believe in yourself because the back of your mind is saying, what are you doing? You don't know anything. And you push that aside and you go, nope, I know enough to get me onto the field. I'm on the team. I'm suited up. I'm on the field. I'm going to go start playing ball. That's what I want you to do. So that's step number two. Number one, choose your niche. Number two, get on the field, start playing. Number three, set your prices. I'm telling you, 
This is the number one thing that I hear and I see that's a huge problem. Practitioners will set their prices through the lens of being a practitioner, which is through this lens of I'm not good enough. Who am I? I don't deserve to be here. I shouldn't be. I there's oh, somebody else is doing it better than me. It's not really me. I'm the one that should be, you know, still going to school, still doing all the things. That's the practitioner that sets that price, which is a next to nothing price. However, when you start your business, when you open your practice, you are by default, whether you like it or not, you have, you've now earned another three-letter title. And that three-letter title is a CEO. You're in charge. The buck stops with you. If the taxes don't get paid, the buck stops with you as the CEO. You are your first hire as a practitioner. So you are the CEO of your practice, but you are also the employee of the practice. You are the first employee. And I sometimes will ask practitioners when I'm coaching with them, I'll say, would you hire you or would you fire you? In other words, are you showing up, doing your job and doing it really well so that you are unfireable? Or are you really a crappy employee? Are you showing up late? Are you kind of just doing a halfway job? Are you not taking good notes? You're not keeping up on your notes. You're not returning emails or phone calls. Because let me tell you, if I was a CEO and you were a practitioner working for me and you were showing up like that, I'd fire you. I say, love you, but you're not cutting the mustard, friend. And out the door you'd go. So are you fireable or are you retainable? As a CEO, you look at your business completely differently. And that includes setting those fees. As a practitioner, if you set your fees, you're going to always set them low. I guarantee because you've got this little imposter syndrome thing that's rolling around in the back of your head. But it's one of the most common things I see is that practitioners don't know how to put their CEO hat on. So we're going to set your prices, but we're going to determine prices as a CEO. So here's the way that the CEO thinks about it. The CEO is looking at, okay, let's see. We have a business. Here's my rent overhead. Here's my utilities overhead. Here's what I have to pay my practitioner employee, which is yourself. But here's what I have to pay my employee every month, right? Your, your pay should come first, by the way. Uh, and here's the, you know, what I have to pay for my software, whatever it is. Right? You've got all those other things you have to pay for. So when it's all said and done, the CEO as a business owner is going to look at all those expenses and say, okay. How much money do we need to make every month and have a little bit of a slush fund that we're putting away every month, even if it's just $25 a week, but how much do we have to set aside in savings? The CEO business owner is going to look at it like that and say, all right, this is how much we have to make in a month. That means we have to see this many people. That means the fee needs to be this for the service that I'm providing the CEO. I mean, the practitioner in the practice is providing our fee needs to be this. So here's my general guideline about fees. Are you ready? I know some of you are going to like, if we were on a phone call, you probably would have already hung up on me by now because I'm, I'm just, I'm just telling you the way it is, but here's my general guideline. If you are listening or watching on YouTube and you are a licensed practitioner, in other words, you've gone through some postgraduate training, you have a degree or certificate behind your name, you have advanced clinical knowledge and expertise, and you, maybe you already have a practice like a chiropractor, acupuncture or someone, you already have an established practice or you have that kind of skill. You're an RN or nurse practitioner. You should not be charging less than around 225 for a new patient appointment. Now I know some of you, I know for a fact that some of the practitioners that I work with will come to me as I'm coaching with them and I'm, one of the first things I ask is, what are you charging? I'll say, well, my new patient appointment is $125. And I just start to like, I have choking sounds. And then I'll say, okay, well, how long is that appointment? Oh, usually about two hours. And that's when I go, <coughs> oh my God, what? What are you talking about? $225 for an hour. That includes though, if you have your new patient intake done, which we're going to talk about next week. But if you, once you have your intake forms done, you can review all of that ahead of time. So remember that kind of takes into account that prep time, but the time, what you're going to charge that patient for 225, 
Your follow-up should be 30 minutes and they should be hundred dollars for a 30 minute, 80 to hundred dollars for a 30 minute follow-up. That's in general, that's how a CEO is going to structure a new patient fee for a person who's just starting out. In other words, we're kind of, you know, we're learning, we're, we're learning the ropes here, but that's a pretty basic place for you to start. But remember that price also equates to quality in the mind of the consumer and our patients are consumers. And so if you have a very inexpensive price, the kind of people that you're going to attract are the, what I call the Grouponers. And no offense to the owners of Groupon, love it, but I won't use it because I'm not that consumer. I want someone who's going to take care of me. I don't want someone who's going to do some cheap crap to me. No, I'm not, I'm out. And I think if you want quality patients that can afford to pay you, then raise your fees. You lose a few people, no question there. But what you're going to attract are the people who say, I'm serious about my health. And if this guy's only charging me $100 and it's a two-hour appointment, uh, he or she may not really know what they're doing. So, nah, whatever. I'm telling you, price in the consumer's mind, price equates to quality. And I know that you're delivering something that's going to transform their life. You're going to change their life. You're going to turn them from being constipated and bloated and miserable and not able to eat foods, you're going to be able to transform their gut and walk them through that process so that they have the rest of their life. They can eat food and they can enjoy their food. They're not stuck to the bathroom or afraid to leave home. You're literally giving them a keys to the kingdom, so to speak. So don't be afraid to charge for it. All right. Those are my first three long podcasts today. I'm so sorry, but I'm not sorry. So number one, choose your niche. Number two, suit up, friend. Get on the field and have just an irreverent, unbelievable, over-the-top respect for yourself and confidence in your ability to make a change. And then put on your CEO hat and run your business like a CEO. Do not let your practitioner brain set your prices because you will undercharge. And once you undercharge, it takes a long time as you're growing that practice to get the fees up. You start them out where they need to be, especially if you're licensed and you have additional training under your belt. All right, enough about that. So that's it. Let your CEO self determine your price, your patients, and your bank account are going to be much happier. All right, take care. See you next week for part two.